Hello and welcome to another edition of PCHEM Lab Screencast. I'm Jeff Yarger and today I want to briefly introduce error analysis uh, and review. I provide this document for the Chemistry 343 uh, Physical Chem Chemistry Laboratory students on the Blackboard site and I'll also uh, soon post this on my Yarger Sci um, downloads a site as well for the, for those who want a copy of this PDF file where I give a brief review of some error analysis techniques. And so I want to go through and highlight just a few important points. And the first is, is that how many students, when they confuse, what I want is error analysis for the mistakes they actually made in the lab. I'm not looking for an error analysis where you tell me I might have misweighed something or I spilled a little of this or uh, I made a mistake when I ran the instrument. That is not, while that is error, that's not the type of blunder error or mistake error we're talking about. We're talking about inherent errors in the experimental data collected. And so things to do with systematic versus random errors in your data. Obviously, if you make a mistake or blunder, you should just redo that experiment. But even in experiments that are done perfectly well, you have certain errors associated with all measurements and in this class it's going to be important in physical chemistry to highlight what those measurement errors are, account for them, and propagate them through your equations. And so that's really what we're talking about here. And so I give a couple concrete examples from uh, things like um, graduated cylinders. If it was, you know, the level was between two lines for example, what you would do is, you know, here you would guess it was halfway between those two. Um, so something like, you know, 292.5 uh, milliliters, and then the error associated with it would probably be plus or minus the difference between the two lines that you were able to have on that graduation. Um, uh, and so there's, you know, that's a, a, a first example of estimating error. And it's what I start off discussing a fair amount, which is estimating error. And the reason is because it's one of the most common things that you do, but one of the things that's least discussed. And so there's tons of books and uh, introductions to statistical error where you take multiple measurements of a single thing, for example, a temperature, you re-measure the temperature five or ten times and you take a standard deviation, um, how much that varies from measurement to measurement. And you use that statistics of standard deviation as your error, your plus or minus error. And that is the most accurate and valid way to do it. However, oftentimes it's not practical to take something like a temperature measurement five or ten times in a row to get a value. Maybe it's changing rapidly over something, or maybe this is just, you know, valuable chemicals that you can't repeat. But that doesn't mean you can't estimate fairly accurately the amount of error associated with it. For example, when you make a measurement in something like this, a thermocouple, and you see that it's reading to a one-tenth of a degree, um, in this case, one-tenth of a degree Fahrenheit, then you can see that this temperature is 199.8 um, degrees Fahrenheit, but what you want to do is be able to report that. Well, it's fluctuating. You'll be able to see the fluctuation in just the tenth of a degree. So your instrument can read it to that accuracy, and so you want to report that as basically the error associated with your measurement. And so that gives you a way. You can do this with balances, oftentimes in volume measurements when you're making pressure like a strain gauge measurement, you can tell it by these digital readouts how much it's varying when you watch dynamically the measurement and it's able to give you a good estimate for the error. And then I provide some examples of what would be silly to do. For example, report it to way too many decimal points, which oftentimes people do, especially when they're in the middle of calculations, because oftentimes a calculation, when you divide one number by the other, it's some type of irrational number that where uh, the decimal point goes on a long time. You need to know how many significant figures based on your error to report that to and report it correctly. So I spent a lot of time discussing some things about uh, um, estimating error, and, and I go through that in class as well because it's very important. And so I'll probably provide a separate screencast on a few concrete examples that we do 
on measurements in physical chemistry. And then I talk about reporting uncertainty. In other words, reporting the amount of error you have. And so two common ways that you report this error, they call it the amount of error or the amount of uncertainty in the measurement. And so you often see E or U used to express um, the variable for uncertainty and or error associated with the measurement. And so I, I talk about just how to report that and how to keep track of significant figures and, and uh, units, etc. So it's just some common practices for common ways to report it. And then I give an introduction to mean and standard deviations, which again is found in numerous books complete textbooks written on this, tons of stuff on the web, so I don't want to belabor the point here, except to say when you make multiple measurements, it's easy to find the mean value, in other words, the average, and use that average uh, right here to give you a statistical standard deviation, where this is the summation over how many different i is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, however many measurements you made, etc. Standard summation in, in uh, mathematics. So, And I go through some examples here. Um, and again, it's it's long, but uh, um, a pretty good rejection of data. If you have a bad data point, how you can you know get rid of that? Again, you need statistical measurements to be able to do that. You need to make the measurement multiple times uh, to be able to do that. And then finally, the thing that most people have problem with which is propagating error. And so first, let's talk about uh, you know a simple thing of what you know propagation of error is, which it really is just like estimating error is kind of a shortcut. It's a shortcut to making the measurement multiple times. If you were to weigh something 10 times, that could give you a real statistical value. But you can often put a penny on a balance and see how much it's fluctuating and get a sense for what the plus or minus is going to be without having to weigh it 10 times. In a sense, a propagation error is that same shortcut. In other words, if you were to do the entire whole experiment uh, that for, for some equation you're using multiple times, so for example, if you were to measure the mass and the volume of something and want to determine the density, if you were to measure the mass uh, uh, of something seven times and then its associated volume seven times and then recalculate the, the associated density seven different times, you could do a statistical amount of error standard deviation error associated with the density. However, just like estimating error is a shortcut, propagation of error is a shortcut uh, when, you're, when you have a measurement where you've measured it uh, one time for each thing, or you have an error associated with each one of those, and then you need to then um, determine the uh, error as it propagates through an equation. And so without having to do the entire thing six times, this gives you, in a sense, a way you know, to handle that. And there are two types. You can have uncorrelated error, which basically means each measurement uh, is independent and the uncertainties aren't very large, but the uncertainty errors are independent of each other. So the mass error is completely independent of the volume error in something uh, you know, like this, uh, a density equation. Um, and so for that, what you do is if you, you take the partial with respect to each variable. So in this case, the partial with res uh, of density with respect to mass and the partial with respect to volume, you square that and you multiply it um, you know, by uh, the amount of error in each of those and take the square root of the whole thing. The, the, the squared and then taking the square root uh, gets rid of any, because this whether the error is in the positive or negative direction doesn't really matter. And so it's still propagating error. And so that accounts for an absolute value type in the error. And then those are added together in this fashion. And so I show an example here where we can take the partial derivative of uh, density with respect to mass and the partial with respect to volume, multiply by each of the associated errors in the mass and the volume, take the square of the whole thing, the square root, and then you're able to determine um, you know, an associated error with that, and then you can report that. Uh, so if I was given a specific mass of 32.52 grams um, and a volume of 35.17 milliliters, I can get a gram per milliliter density, which is 0 0.925. And then the way I determine the error, the plus or minus error in that, is to take the partial with respect to each one times uh, the error in that, the partial with respect uh, to volume, 
the times the error in that, and then take the square of both of those and the square root, and that gives me the overall error associated with it. One of the most common misconceptions here is that you just do the same operation with um, the errors that you would with the measurement itself. In other words, that the error estimation would just be 0.15 divided by 0.52 right, which is roughly 0.3, it's I think 0.2888, which obviously is a huge overestimation of what this uh, equation gives us the error. But to show you how flawed that is, is if we increase the amount of error in the volume by a factor of two, so instead of being half a milliliter, maybe make it a whole milliliter, well now, um, instead of having, you know, uh, 0.288, uh, milliliter, uh, gram per milliliter volume, you know, a density difference for the air, we would actually, you know, half that, right? Because we'd be dividing by twice as big of a number, right? So by having more error in a measurement, we would actually, if we just took the same operation, which is to divide the error in the mass by the error in the volume, we would actually, you know, uh, end up with a smaller amount of error, which makes no physical sense at all. So uh, just to show you how ludicrous what seems to be a very obvious thing, which is just to undergo the same operation for the error measurements that you do with the values themselves is just completely counterintuitive when you actually start putting numbers in there to calculate that. Finally, I give uh, some stuff about fitting data, and this is more appropriate when you're actually doing Excel fits, Kaleidograph, or whatever you're doing, but I give uh, a fair amount of detail detail about how, what least squares are so you understand it from a fundamental standpoint and some things about uh, data, etc. I hope this gives you an, a quick introduction and I'll follow this up uh, with some concrete examples online. Thank you.